I want to introduce one of the women I most admire on those pla in this planet. Welcome with me, Vibeke Sorensen. Okay, thank you, Ludger. That was a beautiful introduction. I'm really touched. And thank you all for coming as well. Um, let's see if I can... It's hard to see everybody out there. <laughs> um, so, just quickly, I studied architecture. I'm kind of a child of the 60s, um, going between Denmark, where I was born, and the United States, and then back again. Um, and I studied architecture, music, science, and art. I was supposed to be a cultured scientist. Uh, but really, after playing classical music for a long time on the violin, I decided to, to play Latin jazz. So I became really interested in a couple of things, the democratic structure of jazz, which remained a um, reference for me uh, for social media, and also for architecture, and the idea of organized information as another kind of architecture, which led me to uh, computing in the 70s. So it was kind of hard to do all these things uh, back then. But the whole idea that I had then, being of the generation I am, is that you either accept technology the way it is or you change it. It's, you, there are only two choices. And I didn't really think it was humanistic enough. My view all these years has been if, it do, if technology does not help us live in greater harmony with nature and other people, it's just not good enough. So uh, I thought, well, it was going to be a crisis. It is still going to be a crisis. It, we have had crises. And we need everybody with creative ideas, all the artists, all the humanists, everybody who can be a good role model to put good ideas out there to encourage people to redirect the technology again towards humanistic approaches. Another thing that I, th I think is that what happens with media, in particular digital media, is it reconstructs our senses and makes them the way our brains work is we make a mental model of the world based on combination of memory and um, sense impression. If media are sense-based and can re remap them to each other, you can create um, new mental models, which can be very creative, as we know, which is what we got a lot here with VR made by artists and scientists. Um, but you can also misinform people. It has this dystopian side, as many people have talked about. And so, mm, again, I think the emphasis has to be not just on critique, but putting uh, really positive models out there. And not only just positive models, but putting out new technologies as well. So I've been involved with technology development for many years. Anyway, and because I'm a I've been a musician and a visual artist, I've, my own work is really in visual music. So anyway, I'm going to jump to um, an, one of my more recent works that um, engage big data. So people already know what big data is, but when I was looking into it, I was thinking about, oh, well, you know, the companies are using this to detect moods of people, the shopping patterns. And I thought, well, that's not what I want big data for. <laughs> I would like to know the mood of the people about what is going on in the world. What is the reaction of people to current events? It's a public space. Big data is kind of the, the potential for visualiz visualizing, if you will, for perceiving visually. Uh, orally through all the sense-based media, what people are feeling and thinking, potentially, right? So um, it's like another kind of public art. So I became very, very interested in that and working with text and language initially to ascertain, well, what are people? You know, looking at, at, at the words. So, um, so initially with words and narrative um, as well, um, so it's without, I'm not going to go into a long discussion about that. I have too much to talk about. So, 
But anyway, I will, uh, this is the background for, for this piece that I call Mood of the Planet. And it's a, light, it's a sculpture with 30 screens and real-time big data from networks such as Twitter, looking at the emotions of people around the world. It was curated by RMIT Melbourne for an exhibition they called Data is Everything. And uh, it was made in collaboration with Naga Raju. Naga, would you stand up, please? Who works with me on many projects. <laughs> and he's so humble, so, uh, but he really can answer a lot of your technical questions, I promise. <laughs> and also with uh, product designer Fabrizio Galli and Mr. Onki Singh and the NTU Museum, Nanyang Technological University. So um, we decided to look at emotions in text using a sentiment analysis um, and also mapping uh, the, the occurrence, the frequency of, of, and the emphasis of certain words into color. And I won't go into all this thing about visual music and color and emotion. You can, if you can read fast, you can see it. Um, and the mapping was made by uh, Professor Marsha Kinder, uh, who's a University of Southern California film school expert on, on media and narrative. So, um, so those are the happiness and those colors. Now, the thing is, of course, as we probably know, colors and meanings are not universal across cultures. People will argue about that. I'm not gonna get into that argument, but it is my view. It's not, they're not universal. So there are problems with this, but so I'll explain how we deal with it. Um, again, you know, these are, this is the same point, that people associate these colors with those emotions and those, and, uh, but um, at a certain point you have to make a decision or know your audience, and I think it's the second. And um, so we're also looking at um, how uh, this kind of physical immersion of the, the, the big data can, how we can uh, um, approach it, because I'm working with sculpture, with, with LED displays and lights and things like that, but also with um, temperature. Turns out that when you have emotions, different emotions, your temperature changes. So when you start looking into this, which is what I've been doing with, uh, with a number of um, neuroscientists and, um, and MDs, and, um, you immediately get into much more than just color-sound relationship, but color, temperature, and, um, and gesture, and facial expression, and we're also, uh, going, we're also working with that now. So anyway, as I said, we were doing initially, this is now, what, three, four years old already, Twitter, looking for keywords and clusters of words, counting, mapping to color, correlating with sound, and using visual music principles, which is my, you know, my primary creative work. Um, so I composed the music with uh, different algorithms for each mood. I use pure data, object-oriented programming language, and then produce animation with After Effects initially, uh, but this would be also real-time algorithmic animation. Um, uh, with the light piece, we developed something that I call a smart tile, which is a plexiglass box and crushed recycled glass, and to work with refraction and um, and, and inside refraction of light, basically, to, which has other uh, possible um, aesthetic opportunities for um, these kinds of displays. And there were speakers, real-time graphics and processing, as I mentioned. Um, but really, the structure, uh, oops, that's not there. The structure was um, working with this idea of home or house, we think about what is our home now in the world of big data. You know, it's this abstract thing that goes beyond our, that's beyond our senses in a way, though it originates in the world of the human being. It comes to us in this very abstract, nonsense-based form, trying to put it back into the sensory experience. And there's always a translation that has to get done, um, and that's the challenge. But in the end, this is our home. We have a hybrid physical virtual data space, 
the third space, some people call it. Um, and so this idea of what is our home, what is our house, um, became a kind of structuring metaphor for the sculpture. So as I mentioned, we were looking um, from at Twitter data and um, using um, looking for words with Python, and, and then use then Python to pure data, counting the words per minute and comparing the numbers inside pure data. I won't, I'm, Naga is there; he can answer all your questions. <laughs> I also program in PD. He's the expert on this with Python. I'm good with the visual music. Um, so and then it was sent to the display. And um, well, anyway, there are all these problems, of course. You know, mapping big amounts of data is always difficult. It's kind of messy. We're working on correlations rather than reasons for the data. That's a whole other thing. You have a phenomenon. Do we really understand it? Well, we can measure it. We're using it. Uh, but as it turns out, we do want to understand it. It's nice being in a university where I can, we can pick the brains of these people. And that's what we're doing. Um, so again, um, we're using data from the network. We're working with network of things, internet of things, and uh, nature. And some of you who know my work from the past know I've been working with detecting um, carbon dioxide and oxygen from plants and things like that. This, this piece does not use that. <laughs> um, so here we're just focused on, on big data. So the thing, it's laid out as a portal, and it represents a passage to greater understanding of our existence on the Earth as a metaverse of sorts, um, you know, a universe of universes that come to us through the data, if, if, that's, if you can, you know, wrap your head around that. It's way beyond our ability to uh, process as individuals, but collectively and with our technology and AI, maybe, our technology can help us.